Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today's a big one for me. It's a great honor. We have Dr. Debbie Jaffe Ellis, and she's going to tell us all about REBT and also about her award she got from the World Health Organization for Holistic Medicine and so much more. Debbie, welcome. Oh, hi, Hecky. It's such a pleasure to be with you and your viewers. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, when you gave your uh, workshop down here in Boca Raton, my daughter, Rebecca Reitman, and uh, Patty Fazano, who's a special ed teacher, they went to see and they called me up. They were so excited, learned so much. It was just terrific. So I called Rebecca, my daughter, and said, do you have any questions? that I can ask. And she said, well, just say hello for me. So my daughter, Rebecca Reitman, says hello. Hi, Rebecca and Patty. Hi. Let's get right to it, because a lot of our audience is probably like me and didn't know until I started reading about you anything about REBT. So why don't you tell us what it is? Okay, well, REBT are the letters uh, standing for Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. And REBT is the pioneering cognitive approach that heralded in the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy. A lot of people have heard of CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, and, and that was developed, the, the father of it is Aaron Beck. And that was, or, or that came out 15 years after Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy that was created by my late husband, Albert Ellis. And in fact, Ellis and Beck corresponded and um, Aaron Beck credits my husband and his work for their immense influence in his development of cognitive behavior therapy. REBT is, in my view and the view of many others, the most holistic of all the cognitive approaches. And in articles written by Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck and Christine Podesky, a wonderful CBT practitioner and teacher, they all agree that REBT is the most philosophical of the cognitive approaches because it is, in addition to being no nonsense, no BS, um, active, directive, practical, it's also imbued with compassion and the the encouragement that people practice unconditional acceptance. So I love it because it's do it along with, but at the same time, have compassion on yourself and others. When I was doing some reading about Albert and yourself and REBT, what struck me that kind of goes along with uh, Different Brains, what we're trying to do at differentbrains.org, is it focuses thusly, as you just described, another way of saying it is, it focuses on the positive steps you can take. It's positive. Get rid of the negative, and let's get down to what's positive. How would you say what I just said better and more in line? The manner of REBT, or the the essence of it is realistic optimism, not romanticism, not Pollyannaism. For those of us who remember the children's book Pollyanna, <laughs> just unrealistically looking for the bright side, because REBT, of course, admits that some things are very bad. It, it wouldn't assert that all things are for the best. Many things can be beneficial. Many rotten things can be beneficial if we choose to learn from them. But again, it avoids sweeping over generalizations. So it's grounded, but it's imbued with hope. You know, where there's life, there is hope, unless we're in, in literally physical pain 
24 hours a day, unless we are too cognitively impaired to, to choose the attitudes and the way that we think. And at some point, Haki, if and when you're ready, I'm happy to share with you the basics of REBT. But, but to answer your question, it's positive in a realistic, optimistic and I think it was Psychology Today who said that your REBT and AL and what you guys have done was more significant than Freud's work. Well, surveys done by the um, Canadian Psychological Society and various American psychological societies, particularly in the late 1980s um, found that that Al's work was in fact more impactful than Freud's you know with his heralding in of the cognitive revolution when Al studied psychology here in New York City at Columbia University by the way in the very same building he studied where I'm now teaching as a professor yeah, teaching REBT and also comparative psychotherapies. Um, you know, Freud was the lord of the psychotherapeutic universe, and Al was the first one to strongly and vigorously assert that you don't need to spend great amounts of time analyzing your past or your childhood in order to be emotionally and mentally healthy in the present. Certainly, it can be informative um, to understand where we might have learned some of our dysfunctional thinking, but to spend more time on it than making that connection can be a waste of time and money for many people. I do want to acknowledge the work of Adler, by the way, which Al also acknowledged. He gave credit where credit was due. And Adler, Alfred Adler certainly had cognitive elements in his work when he also broke away from the Freudian approach. But he did maintain elements of it that, that Al did not. So um, in a forceful way, Al, again, found and shared pragmatic techniques and tools and compassionate philosophies to replace long-term therapy that often included focusing on the past and free association. And again, it might have provided insight for people with the time, luxury and money to do that. But Al wanted a, a no-nonsense for many people, brief therapy that worked and could change their life if they were willing to make the effort to change their thinking. Let's do the basics of REBT by Dr. Debbie Jaffe Ellis. Okay, well, here we go. Well, the first um, essential tenet of REBT, and then again, in addition to having credited Al Adler, you know, Al gave credit to his other influences, which included Stoic philosophers, the Eastern philosophers, certain contemporary philosophers of his time, like Bertrand Russell, John Dewey, and general semantics, Alfred Korzybski, which I already mentioned. So credit where credit is due. The first tenet is, it's not an event. It's not what happens that creates a person's emotions, but their perception of what happens, what they tell themselves about what happens that creates their emotions. So some people who are uh, addicted to vic being a victim may not like REBT because you don't get to blame another person or your circumstance. You know, we have the responsibility for creating our own emotional destiny. So the second main tenet of REBT is when you think in healthy, rational ways in response to adverse conditions or situations, to, to not 
getting what you want or, or getting something or a situation you don't want. We think in healthy, rational ways, we create healthy emotions or what REBT calls healthy negative emotions. Negative, not because they're bad. They're not bad. Actually, they're enriching. But the word negative, because they're not so pleasant. And I'll elaborate on that in just a few moments. And REBT tells us that when we think in irrational ways, we create unhealthy and debilitating emotions. So then the next great offering of REBT is it, it teaches us or it defines the unhealthy versus healthy negative emotions that we create according to the way we think about what happened. The unhealthy, debilitating ones that we create when we think in irrational ways include anxiety, panic, extreme fear, include depression, despondency, and hopelessness, include rage, and include shame and guilt. When we think in rational ways about the same circumstance, then we will create concern instead of anxiety, panic, and excessive fear. Concern is healthy. It can motivate us to do something, yeah? REBT isn't about being neutral and, you know, peace, love, I accept. No, REBT wants us to live an intense life, but an intensely healthy life, to feel our emotions, but to create healthy ones rather than the paralyzing or debilitating ones. So anyway, um, when we think in rational ways, we will create appropriate sadness, disappointment, and grief rather than debilitating depression, despondency, and hopelessness. You know, when, when someone we love dies, it's healthy to experience grief. And some people mistake depression for grief. With grief, grief is very much married to our love of the person or people we've lost. We are deprived of them in our physical life after they die, let's say. Huh? But when we're experiencing grief, we still are able to live a very productive life. And it changes over time. Depression can keep us sinking and spiraling down. When we think in healthy ways, we create what REBT calls healthy anger rather than rage. And I'll elaborate. With rage, we often make a bad situation worse. We are ruled and dominated by the emotion and we react rather than thoughtfully respond. Now, REBT is humanistic to its core, and, and it holds a, a premise that if a human being isn't damaged, then the inclination will be to, to do no harm and to care about others and life and oneself and to do good where possible and doable. And so healthy anger is an experience of either receiving or, or observing unethical behavior from others. And it's that adrenaline fueled no that can come up, but we don't react. We're able to consider what is the most productive thing I might do right now? Run for the hills, speak calmly to the person, Call 911, meditate, do a vigorous workout. You know, we can consider what might be the most appropriate or beneficial action to take. And so that's healthy anger in REBT. Again, not being neutral, not being apathetic when immoral or unethical things happen, 
feeling what we feel and then choosing. Well, a we question see. then, and I hate to interrupt because this is terrific, but what you just described, the difference between rage, which really is when the event goes right to your amygdala and your fight or flight, and what you're saying is with REBT, you stop and switch it over to your prefrontal cortex and consider things logically so you're not immediately reacting. Would that be an accurate assessment? A beautifully accurate assessment, Hacky, yes. Oh, okay. Keep going. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, so we're okay. <laughs> Well, good. <laughs> uh, the, bro the clock doesn't seem too broken, so uh, but, uh, I'll, I'll keep watching that time. Okay. <laughs> keep going and don't let me interrupt. No, you're welcome to interrupt. So then when we think in healthy, rational ways in response to a, a, a difficult circumstance or situation, then we will create regret instead of guilt and shame. Guilt and shame are paralyzing. Guilt and shame are often contributors to people's attempts to end their lives. Regret is important. Again, harking back to the humanistic core of REBT, that, that we be willing to accept that we're fallible human beings. And if we've screwed up, if we've failed at something, if we've made bad mistakes, it doesn't mean we're a mistake. It doesn't mean we're failures. It mean, means we failed at that. And regret will allow us to contemplate our mistaken or failed actions and hopefully not repeat them again. So I hope that's clear, the difference between the healthy and the unhealthy negative emotions. Very clear and very well said. Right. And so then the next offering of REBT is teaching us the difference between the healthy, rational ways of thinking and unhealthy, irrational ways of thinking. And REBT reminds us that Every human, as far as we know, who, who isn't too much brain impaired, cognitively impaired, has the capacity, is born to think in both irrational and rational ways. And as we develop, particularly into adulthood, when we're aware of this, then we have the choice. And we're not controlled or ruled by irrational assumptions and beliefs that we may have taken on through osmosis, through society, through our family, through our community, telling us this is what we should believe. We're able, if we know we have a choice, to choose, to discern about whether we're thinking in helpful or unhelpful ways. And so REBT teaches us the difference. And so I'll start with describing the elements of irrational thinking. And the elements of rational thinking are the 180 opposite of those. So the first one is when we think in irrational ways, we think in rigid ways. We think in demanding ways with shoulds and musts and oughts. Al came up with, with colourful expressions and, and phrases, and one of them is, stop shooting on yourself. And the other one is, it has a U in it, okay, not an A. It's not my Aussie accent. He would say, stop your, with a U, masturbation. Very good word, must. Yeah, stop your musting. So when we think in irrational ways, we, we do that and we, again, words Al created, catastrophize, we awfulize, we blow things out of all realistic proportion, making a mountain out of a molehill and sometimes a molehill out of a mountain. We take things too seriously. 
we there's an absence of humor we think in stereotypical ways as i mentioned earlier we can tend to overgeneralize or think in absolutistic ways we have lft which stands for low frustration tolerance in other words I must have what I want when I want it, little baby that I am. It's very closely related to the condition of I can't stand itis. And finally, when we think in irrational ways, we have the tendency to damn, put down ourselves and others, and life itself, when we or others or life doesn't act or be the way we think it should. Now, Al, in his brilliance, was able to define three core irrational beliefs that so many of us can hold from which infinite others can flourish. And the first one is, I must do well and be loved, liked, adored, or approved of by everyone. The second one is, you must treat me well and or act the way I think you should. That belief is at the heart of terrorism and hatred, where a person of a certain belief thinks that all people should believe that or they should literally go to hell. And the third core irrational belief from which others flourish, life should be fair and just, you know, with justice. You know, Al would uh, wryly say after sharing that, lots of luck. <laughs> and so, you know, from these will come the, the, the need for certainty, the need to be perfect, countless, infinite other irrational and strangling beliefs. So the... Um, the elements of rational thinking are, are the opposite of all of those. When we think in rational ways, we have preferences, we have wants, we have desires. You know, REBT isn't about being neutral or namby-pamby. Want what you want with a passion. Have, have strong goals. That's very healthy. But REBT asserts that when we want something, we desire it, even passionately, and we don't get it, we're likely to then feel healthily disappointed or sad. Whereas if we're thinking we must have it, we should have it, and we don't have it, then we're likely to create either depression, hopelessness, or rage, or, or one of the others. And what I'm getting from REBT is, it's healthy to have grief, it's healthy to have disappointment, but you go on, you learn from it, you do your best, and you say, that's life, pal. Let's go on to the next thing and let's have a good time doing this. That's Hackey's interpretation of REBT. <laughs> yeah, Hackey, you're doing great. And how do people get in touch with you, Debbie? Anyone who wants to learn more about what I do and, and where I'm presenting can look at my website, www ellis as one word, dot com. Well, Debbie Joffe Ellis, I can't thank you enough for spending all this time with us here on Exploring Different Brains. It's been a, a rare privilege for me, and I learned a whole lot. And I want to thank you very much for being with us here at differentbrains.org. Oh, it's my pleasure, Haki. I'd be very happy to come back again, if you like, for another program. And I thank you not only for your questions, but for your presence and, and your openness and willingness to, to be transparent 
in order to to help the understanding of people who are watching this. So thank you. It's been my pleasure. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains, Inc. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.org.